My name is Lindy Berg, and I'd like to welcome you guys. I am the NDSU Extension Agent for Towner County. And on behalf of the Small Farms team, I want to welcome you too. So the Small Farms team is still pretty new to NDSU, but we've been doing a little bit of work here in the last um, three or four years. So I just kind of wanted to talk about some of the things that we have been doing and then some of the things coming up. Um, so the first thing is I wanted to just briefly mention um, there's a publication that we just finished not long ago, and it's called Beginner's Guide to Raising Chickens. So if you feel like that would be useful for anybody, feel free to um, search that and find that um, within the NDSU, NDSU extension publications. And then we also have, um, we're working on a program coming up this fall called Beginner's Guide to Grant Writing. So if anybody is interested or if you're a big into grant writing, um, there is a two day um, grant writing workshop that we're gonna be doing. And so on day one, basically you have your proposal outline, you get all your resources in order to create that full proposal. And then on the second day, you come back with um, that proposal and you're kind of looking at it from the role of the reviewer. And then you get um, to figure out what those strategies are to find funding and providing you with the opportunity to polish that in order to submit it. So um, keep an eye out for that. There's a save the date going out in June, but again, those dates will be um, this fall. Um, a couple other housekeeping items. One is the recording. I always get asked, is there gonna be re a recording link for this? There will be, we are recording today and it will be posted, I'm hoping um, either Thursday or for sure next week, so like Monday, it'll for sure be getting out. So you will get that email with the recording link. Um, if you have any questions, please put those in the chat and we will read those aloud and address those as needed. So again, um, welcome to our topics today is retail meets and inventory management. We have some great people on the call on our panel. So I'm gonna, um, Travis, you can take it over. Thank you, Lindy. And I really appreciate uh, your continued efforts. Of course, uh, this is Lindy and mine's uh, kind of a little bit of a brainchild to, to provide some information for us. But, uh, but also, uh, we have a great team within our, uh, our small uh, farms group uh, to be able to provide a, a little bit of information and a little bit of knowledge uh, for you uh, throughout this evening's function. This is the third of a, a five-part webinar series, and this one's focused on retail meats and inventory management. So this is where we've been at and getting livestock ready for harvest and meat and poultry in the farmer's market for farm to school that we've touched on. Uh, May 24, building your consumer relationships for success, poultry and meat, poultry meat and egg production uh, will be two of our additional um, functions that we have and events that we have coming on. And so just to give you a little bit of background of, of where we've been in uh, this webinar series is that first one that we did was truthfully on evaluating where we're at on end product slaughter. And as I said, getting animals ready for harvest. And in fact, realizing that that it is a big supply chain and what impact that we do have uh, within our industry. And in fact, uh, the top two pictures uh, that I show there is a, a blade chops and our hams uh, that we actually had at our North Dakota State 4-H meats judging contest. And then a cutout, uh, just showing a little bit of differences on what we'll do. And of course, you saw that from the initial slide. And then we'll gather some experiences and some thoughts and some ideas from our talented panelists that we have put together for today's presentation. One of the things that, again, the second one that we did of after we evaluate what it's like to get our animals ready for harvest and knowing when that a correct, appropriate compositional endpoint is, uh, and for beef, pork, lamb, and goat, we've uh, attempted to provide those experiences for all of our producers, um, but we've also had uh, interest of saying, keep it broad, and we've had experiences to saying, keep it tighter and more species specific. So balancing that, but we focused more so last week on, on beef and what we were able to do in getting beef into 71 of the 
200 plus. And so nearly a third of our schools in the North Dakota are able to uh, offer local meets. And that's a good thing for us in terms of making that connection uh, for our producers. And so again, today's will be on retail meets and inventory management, and then building your consumer relationship for success in poultry, meat and egg production um, that uh, Penny Nestor will lead and Lindy will lead our one next week. So a couple of the different things that I wanna talk about, and I'm gonna provide just a little bit of background here before we kind of dig into and, and open it up for our panelists is just the conversion of muscle to meat. And so in fact, we have an impact on dressing percent, uh, and that'll give us an idea in terms of expected cut yield. And then we gotta make decisions. And of course we have Spencer on to join us of what those people make in terms of processing decisions of, of how they want those cut, of whether they're to a certain fat specification, to a certain cut width, uh, or also uh, of how much you want boned or deboned. Uh, and then some in terms of the freezer space. And we have some at the back end. If we get time uh, to talk about some tools that are available. So I still feel that this is the best image and graphic uh, that one can put together. And so this is from the late Dr. Christopher Raines, uh, a talented colleague of mine that served at Pennsylvania State University. And, and in fact, just an average. And of course, those are probably just a smidge more than that of pork at 70, beef at 60, and lambs at 50. And in fact, you should do better uh, than that uh, in terms of the live animal to the carcass portion. But one of the things, and I know, again, we have Spencer and some of our, our processing experts that are on and joining us that can provide some information is that they commonly think that the butcher took our meat. And so if you take in a certain proportion or take in a 1,325 pound calf is that, well, you figure that you're gonna have more. And so even when we think about that is that maybe on here, um, the carcass weight was 787 on the beef. Uh, if you get to the boneless beef or at least closely trimmed and keep some of those like chuck steaks intact, uh, you're gonna have 472 pounds. So that's a realization that is important when I consider myself in terms of meat sciences, uh, that people ask that question a whole bunch to say, what can we do and what can we have an impact on? Those factors that can affect uh, the dressing percentage uh, can be from gut fill, hide, pelt, uh, and those are gonna be different. And of course the wool is different of, on the, the sheep that will have an impact, um, but the mud can have a tremendous amount of impact on the amount of retail yield that you do have. The amount of muscling is important and in the external and internal fat. And I'm gonna go back uh, just uh, to, excuse me, because I didn't touch on these two lambs that were in the background actually came from a Minnesota producer. And so uh, these are uh, Minnesota produced lambs and those are the carcasses below them. And I don't know if that's a uh, hundred percent ideal, but what I can tell you is that in terms of retail yield, uh, those set uh, record levels of what came through our North Dakota State University Meats Lab uh, because there was a tremendous amount of product and muscle that still made it to um, the carcass weight and then also then to retail yield. And when we think about this as our topic on retail meat yield in generalities, uh, there's so many different things that can have an impact. I want to show you uh, all four of our production live animal species here and some cutout information that I was able to work with. And as some know, I have a joint uh, appointment through North Dakota State University and the University of Minnesota. And this is one of the things that we did actually pre-coronavirus 19. And in fact, uh, was there to be able to be used um, as we were having more people that wanted to know where their food comes from. And if there was anything, um, as we think about it, and again, hopefully in the past of coronavirus 19, is that not only did people, um, uh, Ron and Beth, uh, not only did people stock up on toilet paper, um, but they also stocked up on freezers. And when they stocked up on freezers, they felt that it was important uh, to fill their freezer and so that they could do that. And then the demand and the continued demand 
at least in our region and then most likely nationwide, is that people wanted to know this of what can I expect? Well, in this beef one, it's seven ribeye steaks. It's six T-bones and for entertainment value, Spencer, some people want T-bones and they want boneless strips and tenderloins and that's just not how the animal works. And so there's some decisions that have to be made. Uh, sirloin steaks, sirloin tip steaks, round steaks. And truthfully, there's probably the most differences in terms of flexibility in the beef carcass, depending on what you want to have for steaks or roast or what goes into grind or even stew meat. And so from a live weight of 1300 pounds, uh, if they were to purchase a quarter of that, uh, we could expect that uh, 142 pounds would be approximately what you would put into your freezer. Now that's dependent on several different things on how much meat uh, is going to be uh, boned out um, and, and how that's gonna be fabricated and processed. A typical hog, approximately 260 pounds. You're gonna see potentially 13 pounds of pork chops. Uh, you're gonna keep those hams uh, separate most commonly. Uh, the ribs and the bacon uh, are some of the things that we can have. And of course our, our bacon, at least in the retail store and truthfully, some of those ribs are some of the higher value cuts uh, that we pr provide. Some of those shoulder roasts, uh, you might wanna keep the Boston butt uh, intact so that you could put that on the grill here because we've moved past the middle of May in North Dakota, America. And so um, the, the snow is now melted, which means the grill should now be on. Um, and so just depending on what we want to do and how we look at that from a hog. So a half of a hog uh, would make about uh, 60 to 70 pounds of product uh, would be our expected yield that would go into the freezer. This is our one for our whole lambs. And so if we looked at a typical market lamb at 140 pounds, uh, we can expect eight uh, shoulder chops uh, if we were to make it that, and those would be arm and blade chops. And then you can decide of whether you wanted to keep that in a crown roast or in rib chops, 14 potential loin chops at approximately an inch and a quarter. Of course, we have the shanks and the ribs. And, and then depending on how we want to do that on ground lamb or um, in the most flexibility, at least in the sheep and, and lamb industry, is what you wanted to do with a leg. If you wanted to keep that in a roast, uh, put that into kebab or stew meat or, or even to grind that. The goat uh, is not fabricated at the same level as either of the three species um, aforementioned. And so commonly those would just be pulled off as primals. And then some people can decide to roast that or, or cube that. Truthfully, if you were to look at the rack and or loin, um, those aren't commonly large enough in terms of the, just the meat that's gonna be on those to make uh, you know, the, the loin chops that you could in a lamb or a pork or obviously the ribeye and a beef animal. And so more commonly pulled together just in, in primals depending on how you want those. Again, I put the link on here that's uh, extension.umn.edu slash save money food slash buying animals meat processing. And so that's where I pulled all of those from uh, that can have, if you were to have a sheep, uh, you'd get approximately 47 pounds of cut uh, of retail lamb cuts or retail ready lamb cuts uh, from a 140 pound lamb. And so again, we're closer there to truthfully a third of our product. Uh, and then our lamb or our, excuse me, our goats, just depending on how much you wanted to bone that goat out uh, would help us as well in terms of what is offered there. And so retail cuts and primals just in generalities is extremely important uh, in terms of what we want to accomplish. We have a talented group of presenters that'll join us for this evening. Um, our first one is Mr. Isaac Brunkow. Uh, Isaac uh, serves as a graduate student uh, under my direction at North Dakota State University. And we'll allow him to tell and share his story. We'll follow that um, up with uh, Mr. Ron and Ms. Bez Beth Wolf uh, to talk about Wolf suffix. And Jonah Freeze is gonna talk about Freeze Family Farms. And then Spencer Wirt is our, um, our processing expert uh, that is associated now uh, with six in one meats. And so Isaac, I'm gonna allow you the floor uh, to tell your story and we look forward to people. Please put your questions in the chat 
And we hope this to be interactive and, and a good dialogue and question and answer period uh, for those that we do have to, to join us. And so, Isaac, please tell us about Bronkow Family Lamb. Oh, thank you, Travis. Um, my family uh, has a ranch in northeastern Kansas, just outside of Manhattan. Uh, we primarily raise uh, cattle and crops, and that was where we got most of our foundation for our ranch from. Although uh, we started operating a sheep flock uh, through a 4A overgrown 4-H project. Um, like Travis said, I'm currently up here studying under him as a grad student, uh, doing some extension research under him. And I did my undergrad at K-State uh, in animal science. Uh, moving forward on to a little more about our operation. Uh, so our fam my family's uh, flock is mostly focused on terminal production. Uh, we do a lot with uh, uh, crossbred sheep, especially those black face crosses uh, with a Suffolk Hampshire focus. Um, although my personal favorite, I have a small flock of South Downs. And my dad has recently acquired some Dorsets. Uh, so we're working on incorporating those sheep into our herds. Um, we don't really have a super large uh, operation in terms of grazing on grass. So we do focus mostly on corn finished lambs, uh, which sometimes is a desirable uh, characteristic, especially if corn prices are not like, or, or lower than they are currently. Um, we focus on trying to get lean to sheds into every pen because uh, that Kansas sun can get pretty hot, especially around that summertime on anything with a wool coat like sheep hat. Continuing on, uh, we have a few goals in mind with our sheep operation. Uh, we focus on high quality lamb meat, and that's focus. The focus with that is through butcher shop sales. Uh, we have some partnerships with a. Uh, the main partnership is with a uh, butcher shop in South Central Kansas uh, that focuses on uh, the direct to consumer retail counter. Uh, we have a lot of people that come in and see our product as we're the main producer of lamb for uh, Yoder meat. In addition to that, we do do some direct sales where we focus on trying to get people to come out and incorporate a little bit of agritourism into it, uh, showing them the face of the producer because not everybody knows a rancher or farmer anymore. And it's good to get that face-to-face -face interaction with the people that are buying and eating your product. Uh, we've started to see some interest recently in getting our product into restaurants. We are currently figuring out how we're going to incorporate that, though, because uh, there's some different challenges that come with moving product to a restaurant setting as opposed to direct, shop, direct sales or butcher shops. In addition to that, we do sell some replacement use. Uh, we try our best to maintain some good records cull the bottom third of our flock and really, like I said, focus on those hybrid uh, bloodlines minus my uh, South Downs and Dad's Dorsets. Uh, and then the two young ladies uh, in my pictures down here are two of the girls that show sheep for me back home. Uh, don't have anything super showy, but I like to see my lambs uh, go to the local fairs and support the local 4-H'ers. So uh, continue on focus on our, the lamb side of our uh, operation. Uh, we talk, I talked a little bit about we contract with uh, Yoder Meat Market down in Yoder, Kansas. And we try to bring 30 lambs a month for three months over that finishing period, uh, late summer to fall. Uh, and then also with that, we do... They do allow us to bring in extra lambs and they'll process it for us and return the meat to us so we can do direct to say, uh, consumer marketing. Uh, with that being said, in Kansas, you have to be licensed, licensed and inspected annually by the KDA. And we only sold whole or half carcasses previously. Uh, we've changed our license to where we could sell the individual cuts. Uh, and we do some custom processing of, uh, with uh, ethnic and home processing, processing uh, customers. Uh, what comes to mind is we have an Albanian family that likes to come out and 
the father had grown up on a sheep farm in Albania and he likes misses processing lamb. So that's what he comes out and does. And there is some loopholes you, you might have to consider when doing that or not loopholes, but, uh, uh, Oh, some laws and other things you might have to focus on. So currently we're working on a few different products. Uh, my father, the owner of Yoder Meat Market, and uh, myself have kind of working on some value-added products. Uh, back home in Kansas, beer rock is the state food. It is basically a dinner roll stuffed with traditionally ground beef, but we're looking at trying to incorporate lamb into that. And I've done some experimenting on it because uh, it's an easily frozen product, and I think you could really uh, add value to uh, your catalog by incorporating that and some frozen meals and sausages. In addition to that, uh, we've started working on a cookbook with some, I have a sample here on the right of the slide where we've taken some different recipes and incorporated lamb into them just to help that consumer uh, get a, a better idea of what recipes work with lamb. Uh, and recently, my father has talked to me about we are going to start using a new program that I think works really well with tonight's topic. Uh, it's called Barn to Door, and they help you with your marketing and your web page and social media. But the most important thing I think that is going to be super great with this program is they help you with your inventory management. They have di digital inventory, which will be super great. Uh, helps you keep track of what you're selling, what's moving, and generate some statistics based off that. Thank you, Isaac, for providing a little bit of background on on your uh, operation and, and telling the story. Um, and well, um, the quick question, okay, is uh, what is a beer rock, or how how can you describe that just a little bit better for us Northerners? Um. Like I said, it's it's uh, actually a Volga German food. So when I moved up here to NDSU, I was surprised no one had ever had it before. Uh, there's a lot of that same culture up here. But it's uh, basically, like I said, it's a dinner roll, just a nice buttery dinner roll. And then you take cabbage and ground meat and stuff it. Um, and that's a big, big thing back home. A lot like I remember before football games, the mo moms would serve the whole team Birak. Um, it's just a nice, easy, quick meal. Uh, and I've started using lamb in mine, and a lot of my friends and my girlfriend have really appreciated the use of lamb in that. It adds a new element to it and can kind of pep up that uh, traditional beer rock. Good. Thank you. And, and even for those uh, even crazier, those that live in in Nebraska, right, Isaac, uh, uh, Runza built a, a lifestyle on that, right? Uh, I mean, uh, apparently that's that's what they are, is uh, the runs of the building. You're putting, putting a meat uh, and, and some flavorings into uh, uh, a topic that they can do. So that's not everywhere, but, man, you're right. In Kansas and the central part of our country, that's something that's certainly important. Uh, we're going to pass it to uh, to Jonah Freeze, actually, next, and then will allow Ron and Beth to kind of pull us together here, I think. So um, I, I pulled together just a little bit of, of information. And so you see, at least from the right side, of some teriyaki snack sticks. And uh, the top one uh, at least shows that it is USDA inspected. And, and truthfully there, Jonah, um, kind of your logo. Uh, and when you kind of dig through this, and you'll see this uh, both with with Freeze Family Farms, you saw it on Isaac's with the Brunkow Family Farm is that they do have a logo as well. And we'll see that uh, with our wolf suffix as well. Um, and I just put in a, a boneless leg of lamb uh, that, that can be there as well. And so Jonah, the floor is yours. Tell us, tell us what makes, what makes Freeze Family Farm uh, who you are and kind of how you've built uh, your ideas, particularly at the retail and, and farmer's market approaches. Jonah? Well, I guess I've been raising sheep for most of my life, which is coming up on 50 years, uh, starting with Cordale sheep. And that's been that's been about almost getting up to 50. We've added Lincolns and Border Lesters now in the last five years. And so 
we start out as a uh, purebred uh, breeding operation. And of course we can only market so many rams. So in 2019, I had this uh, idea. I had people that would do, I would, we kind of wanted to promote lamb and the, and the um, people would come back and say, you know, we'd really like to try it, but you can't find it or else they uh, hadn't tried it. Couldn't find it. They had, they do like it, but they still couldn't find it. And I'm like, well, gee whiz, maybe I should think about doing some, uh, uh, checking in to see what it would cost or see what it would be to, to promote the lamb and to maybe do like a farmer's market. So then I talked to a couple of my friends, one out in the East coast and one in South Dakota, just to get a little idea and kind of where to start and whatever. So then I decided to do it, uh, checked out with the health department, what I had to do, uh, tried to find a, a USDA facility to get the lambs processed, which we had one that was per, uh, newly purchased and it was only like 30 miles away. So it was, I checked with them and I could get lambs in. So I kind of got the ball rolling, bought a cargo or a little enclosed trailer, got some freezers, got inspected and approved and away we went. And um, so I got some lambs processed and made them into uh, the cuts like your roasts and your chops. And then I went to a local farmer's market, it was very well received. Um, and then also what I did is you can only sell so much ground as far as I'm concerned. And so um, my butcher, he had some snack sticks there, which were beef. And I'm like, gee whiz, I wonder what they'd be like for lamb. So I, we have to take our, our trim to another processor that's federally inspected to do the um, smoked processed meat. So they had recipes for the Euro meat, the uh, snack sticks, country style, and also brats. And so we went ahead with that. We added pork with the lamb. Uh, and the reason for that was just to, so that we could sell the product, you know, at a little more reasonable price. And so since then, I've been doing farmer's markets. Uh, we have Pride of Dakota showcase events. And in those, we do uh, sampling of the snack sticks. And once they try them, I mean, people buy them. They're, they're crazy over them. And so since then, um, we've put them into a local gro or local gas station convenience store here in my town, and they'll sell probably 50 sticks a month. And uh, so that's, that's pretty exciting. So that helps to get rid of some of those, that avenue, also the grocery store in uh, New Salem. They also handle our, all of our lamb, in fact. And so that's been pretty, that's been a pretty good process for that. And uh, we just keep on going. We're, we have lambs too that we also sell on a um, uh, with a, a direct sale for the customer, and we have a repeat customer list on that, and they rave how great the lamb taste is. So that continues to build. I still do so, well, not quite as many farmers markets. Last year it was so hot. So I I'm old and chubby, so I didn't. That just didn't appeal to me. So. <laughs> So anyway, um, we still sold a lot of lamb. Uh, I have a uh, appointment set up for this year. The, the big um, problem for us is now that the local guy that I went to like 30 miles away, he decided he's no longer going to do lamb because they can put in all these beef and they don't have to deal with lamb since it's a little more tedious, I guess, as far as cutting up and whatever. But so now what I have to do is I can get some in at a local basis here, but it's kind of like to see if they have room for me. And if they don't, that's kind of hard to um, plan on that. So now I have to go a um, little over three hours one way to deliver my lambs to get them processed. And so that's kind of where I'm, that's the biggest frustration, I guess, right now. The other thing I do too is <clears throat> with my breeds of sheep, they have very nice wool pelts. So I'll send those pelts into a tannery in in wisconsin and so that's another avenue for a little extra income off that lamb so other than that um you know what my promotion would be through the farmers markets or pride of dakota events i also do some items i hand make with wool so it's kind of a really nice fit to promote lamb and wool thank you jonah and in fact uh you know just one of the things as you described there um you know, the, the challenge in terms of, of processing plants. And I guess in, in terms of our, 
our function that we have here of, of saying, if we want to be able to direct market and to locally produce those, it truthfully requires, you know, a relationship with your processor. And that's one of the things that, that uh, I know that Ron and Beth can, can touch on as well is that even if you have the product, um, you know, uh, the, w- the way that we've seen it here now in the last truthfully two to three years is that people say, okay, well, uh, I, I may not be able to fit you in. And so hopefully you provide enough rapport uh, that they can be able to say, you know what, we, we can try to fit you in on a next Tuesday or whatever that may be. So um, I'm being able to provide that. You saw that, uh, ladies and gentlemen, in terms of the, the teriyaki snack sticks and an original snack sticks and the country style sausage. And in fact, the, the Euro meat as well. And so thinking outside the box just a little bit in terms of diversification. And I know this isn't the, the, the avenue or the spot to talk about, you know, some of the wool products, Jonah. Um, don't get me wrong, but I put those pictures in there. Because when I'm thinking about this is that even if you were to aim to do a farmer's market, and the reason that I described that of saying, how can we be better at merchandising those from a retail standpoint is that maybe there's um, a local person that produces honey or, um, you know, pulls together some salsas or whatever that may be. And so just, um, just, I wanted to leave that in there. In terms of thoughts, when you make those investments to be there direct to market to somebody that can potentially share some of that costs mm-hmm. and or profits. Um, and so it, it doesn't take much uh, if you're going to offer, you know, retail uh, snack sticks and, and lamb uh, to be able to have something else that could be outside that box as well. And so I think that's one of the things that I enjoy about Jonah is that um, Jonah, you, you set goals. Um, but in fact, I've never, uh, I've never seen you reach all of those goals because Jonah, whenever you get to a goal, you make a different one. All right. And so, uh, which, which you don't like see, um, or know, uh, that that's the case. And so, uh, whenever you get something accomplished and whether it was saying Jonah is going to make it to the, the farmer's market said, cool, great. Thanks. Now I'm going to get a retail storefront. And then it was like, cool, great. Thanks. I've sold all my lamb loin chops. Now what am I going to do? And so I really, really appreciate your thoughts and uh, I look forward to any uh, future conversation as we describe this. Um, so Jonah, thank you for giving the, the quick update in terms of the freeze family farms. We're going to move on. And uh, this one's a, a team approach um, because uh, of course, you know, we got the Ron that uh, considers himself the face of the industry. And then Beth is, uh, actually is the mastermind and does the talent. And we know that Ron takes little of that in terms of the actual talent uh, of uh, the team. Uh, but uh, more importantly, I've, I've known them for a long time. And, um, you know, they said, okay, we have some Suffolk sheep and we think that we can be able to market it. And some of the thoughts that they've been able to do and kind of pull things together, uh, that's in home base there, kind of Oaks, North Dakota. And again, uh, USDA inspected processing, and I just want to touch on this as we think about where we can have an impact is that we have three different kinds of custom exempt. And in order to sell at custom exempt locations, you need to sell the animal. Um, and those need to go in as the animal. And then truthfully, you can sell that to somebody but they can provide those processing uh, instructions or wherever that may be. And that's a lot of it to just, again, bring it back to the breadth of what we're trying to do on our direct markets. And even if you were to have beef or pork or sheep or goats, that you can be able to sell in terms of custom exempt, the live animal, and then they can choose how they want to process that. State inspected needs to stay inside of the state that it is inspected of. But it can be, and you can go through the Department of Agriculture, the Department of Health to get that licensing. And I, well, I will say that the USDA inspection is something that can allow us to offer those to be sold at any different places. And I will do my best, Lindy, to pass it on to Ron and Beth. Thank you. Well, thanks, Travis. Uh, appreciate the opportunity here to talk a little bit about our operation. And uh, yeah, as you see, Wolf Suffix, which we have been at it 40 some years and, and the passion of it is, is a, it is a seed stock operation first and foremost with us. Um, 
it's been something, you know, the show ring's important to us. It's kind of my, my competition. Uh, we like to sell and get youth involved, uh, much like Isaac. Uh, we have had our own private tree uh, production sale. We just got done at the end of April with our 18th. And a lot of that focuses on the youth and expanding other kids to be part of that. And so we were in running that 50 to 60 head of sheep. And so our, with my job being outside an agricultural base, uh, we tried, you know, the lamb pretty much in that January, February and bleed into March, probably a little more than we should to get through all of our use. So our lambs, you know, are basically you know, weaned at this time and on full feed. And, uh, you know, we're for, fairly fortunate uh, as far as livestock market. We have an active livestock market about 60 miles away that, you know, is pretty good for the, for the fat lamb. But when you're only running this amount of use and, and you're selling use and keeping back bucks, uh, we didn't, uh, we didn't always have a large amount of lambs that were market ready at the same time. And so it became an, an issue and we'd go to the sale barn of eight to 10 or 12 lambs, you know, depending on who was there that day and how big or how much they wanted the lambs. And, and so, you know, even when there was a good market, some days maybe our lambs weren't accepted real well. And, and so, you know, we were always at the mercy of who was showing up at the sale barn for a few head of lambs and whether they needed them. And I guess, you know, so at that point, about five years ago, and I'll turn this over to Beth, because this was kind of her mastermind, but five years ago, we decided we were going to control and market, try to market all of the sheep or as many as we could and, and price them, you know, be in control of what we got for them. And so this, uh, she did the research and I'm going to let Beth talk about the, the farmer's market a little bit. So like Jonah, we uh, reached out to the Department of Health and found out what we needed to do that way. And then I kind of started researching farmers markets to see where we thought that we could find a a good farmers market. But I'm kind of selfish with my time. I did not want to have to be at market all the time. So we found a farmers market and the first the first two years, Ron, or the first year? I don't remember for sure. We were there every weekend and it was, it was a lot. And so then we, um, we go to the Red Rivers Farmer's Market in Fargo and we decided that we were going to start going every other week. And that has worked out really well for us. We have probably... 80% of our customers are repeat customers. Um, We've, we've developed a really great relationship with them. And that's, that's all always our goal is to develop that relationship, get to know the people when you see them coming and they start waving at you. That's, that's a lot of fun and it's exciting. And we kind of have some side chatter between Ron and I on how many packages of kebab, do you think they're going to get today or how many ground beef or ground lamb or any of that? Um, I would say probably one of our, our biggest goals is to get a package of lamb on at least one or two new customers tables each week and then hope to see them back again. We, we feel like we probably could raise our prices a little bit, but yet having lived on a budget all of our life, we want people to be able to enjoy lamb and afford it. So we, we price our meat, what we feel comfortable knowing that we are making a profit at it, but we're not, it's, it's not priced so high that, somebody's not going to be able to say, oh, I, I just want to try some chops. So we, we price ours. I always go on to the USDA website each year and see where they're at and um, try and get try and get pretty close to that and to what other producers are pricing theirs at in our, in our area. These are some pictures of uh, the different cuts that we have. A couple years ago, we had somebody request and 
so now we do heart and kidney and liver and they actually are, are very good sellers for us. Um, shanks are a, a good seller. Our steaks are a tremendous seller, of course, chops and lollipops. And then our lamb sticks are 100% lamb. And there's, that's, that's what they are, 100% lamb. And boy, we can't keep those each week. It's like, okay, we're going to throw in a couple more this week. And then we sell out that week too. Our goal, one of our goals is to get them into the convenience store. And then about two miles away, we have, we have just a little tavern, the Ludden Tavern, and we're going to start putting some in her refrigerator. And as our friends and, and locals are there and hunting season, when the hunters are in there, hopefully they'll grab a, a packet of wolves. Wolf suffix lamb sticks. So I don't know what else, Ron. Well, we do sell holes and halves, and we have some already reserved. Uh, we do have somewhat of an ethnic market locally uh, with the with the farm labor, and, and most of our the locals would be South African uh, folks, and that you know when we talk to them, that is their their favorite meat, and so that's been an outlet of ours. Uh, but as we go into our retail cuts we kind of let our, our farmer's market uh, customers dictate as we seasonally go through. And of course, when Travis was talking about grilling season, you know, the steaks and the chops and, and that kind of stuff are popular early on. And we seem as we get into the September and October that maybe the roast starts selling better because they're a comfort food. And, and one other thing that Beth started doing a year or so ago and in, in conjunction with our processor, she started leaving our, our rib, our sides of ribs whole. And so when they come and wanted to see our ribs, they've got a two or three pound, because it seems like all these young people are foodies, they've got smokers and, and they want to experiment with a big piece of meat. And, and so those are fairly popular. And you bring a, a rack of rib out uh, of a Suffolk lamb that's probably, you know, a couple feet long. Uh, you know, their eyes get big and then all of a sudden it's like, hey, I could try this. And so that is that has become something that I think we're going to go with going forward. And and so we've done the farmer's market for five years. And I'm proud enough to say the last three years, the sale barn has not seen a lamb of ours. And so we have priced we are currently in the last three years and hopefully we continue pricing every sheep in one way or other that leaves this place. And so. It is directly from the wolves to the consumer, and, and we don't deal with any marketing in between at this point in time. And we do have uh, lamb in three different restaurants, in Fargo restaurants, whatever. Uh, and ironically, at this time, the ground is the important or the easy sell of them because they're, it's uh, you know, very diversified, and they do different things with it. So. Thank you, Ron and Beth. And that's why kind of I thought it was imperative that we included you in this. And I put the, a little bit of a pizza at the bottom end and that should have some Wolf Suffolk uh, kind of uh, lamb on that. Uh, expand just a little bit on that, would you please? Well, I, you know, and, and we were fortunate enough uh, because of the, we're the, the location of the Red River Farmers Market and it is a market we apply to every year. And we have to set our schedule with them. And luckily we've been accepted back, but being up on Broadway is, uh, has been very advantageous to us because of how much uh, resurrection of Fargo, I think has been put into that. And we actually, and I'll put a plug in for Casey at the Blackford, Blackbird Wood Fired Grill, met us at the first farmer's market or first year. And he said, you know, he introduced himself and, and said, you know, what is, plan is and he'd like to try our product and we've had a relationship with Casey for the last five years and, and fortunately uh, with if you happen to see it or not uh, we had a uh, interview with Ag Week TV uh, here two weeks ago or three weeks ago at our farm and, and it didn't start out that wasn't the purpose behind it but uh, it, it turned into from pasture to pizza and included Casey and and with that relationship, actually, we started providing lamb, ground lamb to a new restaurant in West Fargo. And so uh, him being satisfied with our product, 
project, he's a very positive advocate for Wolf Suffolk lamb. And, and so relationships, as Beth said earlier, are a big thing for us in there. And, uh, and that is one of the, you know, direct pluses for us. And, and Jonah talking about, you know, and I'll throw that and didn't mention it. We are fortunate enough that we have a federally inspected meat plant eight miles from our house. So the convenience of that is huge. I can drop those lambs off on my appointment when I go to work. And a few days later, I can pick it up on my way home. And uh, that saves us time and money. Good. Thank you. And in fact, uh, you know, it's exciting. You saw the the snack sticks that, that Jonah has and then the, the snack sticks that the, the Wolf uh, Suffolk family has there on, on pulling those together. And so I uh, appreciate that. I would like to also entertain to our uh, people that, and our attendees that are joining us to, again, please put a, uh, any questions that you may have for this trio of producers into the chat box. Um, but I'm going to like to lead that discussion um, for the most part and say, you know, what, what, what have you identified as, you know, the, the thing that, that uh, is your best seller? What, what makes you, you Ron? I would say it's a lollipop. Uh, and, and we knew nothing about that Travis until we went to a wedding reception locally. And, and they had the young couple uh, who are in the sheep business, had them brought up, I think, uh, from Superior, and they were grilled. And, you know, what's better than meat with a stick, you know, yeah. kind of deal. And uh, with a handle. And, and you know, we are selling some bone, but the novelty of it, and, of course, it's a high-quality um, cut of meat. And then I would say maybe our second best would be the kebab meat because people, you know, come to us and say, I've never had it. What's something good to start with? Well, here you have chunks of lamb and, and grilling season or stew, you know, whatever. You, there's a multitude of things you can go with there and, and still get the, the texture and everything of the lamb. And so those are both big sellers for us. Jonah, Jonah, what makes Freeze Family uh, lamb there? What, 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 makes you, what makes you you? What, what's the best seller? Why does it work the way it does? Well, I'd say the snack sticks probably are. And um, there, too, as far as, like, the leg steaks, you know, I sell them as leg steak and tell them that would make great kebab meat. So if they want to do their own kebabs, they can cut it up and do that. So that's a good one, too. You know, if they want to try lamb, that's a good cut. Isaac, uh, what, have, what have you guys found uh, with your guys' game? Again, you're an import, all right, from Kansas. But uh, what, what, what's been working for you? Um, we don't have as much uh, of the uh, value-added products as the other panelists do. Uh, we move a lot of the bone-in leg, uh, especially around the holidays. Uh, I, I've released some recipes that seem to be really uh, – and we have a lot of barbecue in our area that people really, really love those. Um, in addition to that, we do sell a lot of the uh, old traditional loin chops. Uh, people – really like eating those and grilling and that seems to be our biggest uh products that we move super thank you uh isaac for being able to provide that and in fact uh, i think that's one of the most important things as we describe it and uh not to just be sheep centric but you know we can we can sell those loin chops um, or even the bone-in legs like Isaac described. But what I've really, really appreciated is, is Jonah and, and Ron and Beth's um, approaches in terms of expanding the markets. And so realizing that, because truthfully, if we were going to be able to do that, and again, to, to provide some breadth to that is from the beef industry, we can sell ribeyes, okay? And we can sell strip loins. It's what we want to do with uh, the brisket, or the, the ground meats and the roasts uh, that we may have, or even the Boston butts and the, the hams that we approach um, with our pork industry and, and truthfully trying to provide all of those. So we do have a question, and I think this is a pertinent one to continue to ask before we move into Spencer's thoughts of, of the game here and, and pulling everything together. That, and you probably saw this in the chat, and so hopefully your head's up and in terms of laws and regulations, what have you had to 
do in order to sell the meat out of an inspected processor. And in fact, I'm going to lead it with Ron and Beth, um, but I know you had to at least get some licensing in order to do that. And so go ahead, Ron and Beth, and we'll provide that just as a great uh, segue to move forward. Okay, well, we, I did call the Department of Health and requested the license. And so then the inspector came down and you know, said, well, what are your plans? And so we kind of, we talked about the plans and he was, he was a very nice gentleman. He was here the first time for probably an hour and a half. He did try to talk us into applying for a grant for a multi-million dollar butchering facility on our farm. I said, as a childcare provider, I did not think that I wanted to have that on the farm as well. There would just be too many hats on my head. So we, we declined that offer to, to do that. But um, so then we, we talked with our, our local butcher. And at that time, it was the butcher block. And he was federally inspected. And state. state fact, yes. No, state. he was state inspected, which meant then we could only sell in North Dakota, which was fine. You know, we didn't have, we didn't have big plans. And so then... We got the license, we bought the freezers. Um, then when we go to Fargo, we have to have, well, we have to have our coolers inspected. So we basically, we sign a, a piece of paper and we pay them money and we get a license from Cass County Public Health that we're okay to sell our meat there. It's it's just a hoop that we have to do. And they do come out yearly and inspect our freezer area yes. and space. But yes. Um, and we have to apply for it every year and pay a fee. Yeah. But uh, once once you're in and doing the right thing, it's it's pretty easy. And then like in, in Fargo, we've we've never had an inspection there, but we always take we always take thermometers along with us in each of the coolers. So that, you know, if we did, we would be covered that way. Um, it would be nice. I've tried to talk to Shepard here into getting a little trailer because we are getting up there in age. So it would be nice to have just a trailer with the freezers in there that we just hooked up. But I haven't quite got him on board yet. Good. And there, uh, there's, a, there's a point of information uh, in our uh, chat that says that the Department of Health Safety rules depend on the location of the state. And if we were to make this North Dakota specific, uh, absolutely, uh, that is the Department of Health. Uh, and Bismarck has its own, Fargo has its own, and there's several different uh, approaches uh, of where those um, information, you know, is the requirements of who you have to work with. Jonah, the floor is yours. What did you have to do in order to be able to merchandise your products? Well, first of all, I called the ag department and then they sent me over to the um, health department. And then the health department said, based on where we're located at, we have to go through Custer Health, which takes care of five counties in our area. And then that's who I uh, had to do my work through and make the application and indicate who your processor would be. And then that's, it wasn't that big of a deal just to get my trailer and freezers checked and then she granted the license. Good, thank you. Isaac, uh, you know, you're at least in North Dakota now, um, but at least uh, from a, a Kansas standpoint, what what do you know in terms of what you needed to do? And in fact, we, we like to make these uh, webinars as, as uh, broad as we can so that it fits with other people. And we realize that there's also um, evaluate where you're at with your own department of agriculture and your own department of health because uh, we can be able to make these as targeted for North Dakota but we also are striving to make them as broad so that people can understand where they need to go. Isaac what did you get to do? Um, ours is actually all through the Kansas Department of Ag. Um, we didn't really have to do anything with the the health department. Uh, there's a couple different options for licensing uh, in Kansas, uh, moving whole carcasses and breaking them down into the halves and the quarters, depending on what species you're doing, uh, is not as heavily regulated. 
However, when you start doing that direct marketing, especially on your operation and moving those individual cuts is where uh, more inspection comes into play. Uh, like uh, uh, Wolf's were saying, the, in Kansas, they do come out and inspect your freezers and stuff yearly. Uh, and that's basically where it boils down to. Uh, it's a little different than North Dakota, but a lot of it is the same. Uh, and going from state to state, you just got to check in with uh, most states, especially these Midwestern states that have a lot of producers do have uh, good information. Uh, I know North Dakota has a really good handbook for direct marketing for uh, producers to use. So uh, just checking with your state is the a great way to ensure you're following regulations. Isaac, about how many head do you guys run through your operation? So we try to do 25 to 30 head in three months because uh, they like to slaughter them all at the same time, trying to get some good groups going. Uh, so we move about 90 head uh, up to maybe 110 head, depending on the interest. And just, I mean, everybody knows that, uh, Sometimes uh, your lamb crop doesn't turn out quite right. So you have some reduced numbers. So just those factors, that's a pretty average range for us. Good. Thank you, Isaac. And so uh, to keep that up to date, uh, Isaac says that they can do about 100. Um, Jonah and Ron are closer to 30 or 40 uh, head uh, approximately a year, which truthfully I consider still a, a sizable number. And in fact, I have a talented group there of a, a trio of producers and I really, really appreciate your approach. But I think to bring this uh, around and to keep it full circle, even as we talk about it from a retail cuts and, and inventory management is that I wanted to, to include uh, my colleague, Mr. Spencer Wirt. And so uh, Mr. Spencer Wirt uh, previously uh, was a, a graduate at, at North Dakota State University, in fact, it is a master's degree at North Dakota State uh, in meat sciences and has was uh, and is and was uh, an icon in the game, right, uh, you know, Spencer? And so, uh, but he's moved on and, and works at six and one meats right now. And in fact, I, I put that on there because he works uh, now every Thursday uh, with KFGO 790 AM. Um, and so I've never made it to this level, Spencer, uh, but now he has a title, uh, and so they call him in and they say, hey, the meat dude, uh, teach us. And so, uh, Spencer, uh, I, I threw a, a slide together for you uh, that has him at some of our barbecue boot camps where we tell the story. Uh, truthfully, NDSU was one of the, the teams and groups that was, that was kind of at the front, I think, in, in terms of just being able to be producer to consumer and telling that story, the difference is, is that they use barbecue uh, as the answer to be able to pull stuff together. And in fact, some of those top ones, I pulled him together of, of a project that I was working at where we talked about some lamb fabrication. And then also he has plenty of knowledge in terms of processed meats as well. And so, Spencer, you've got to listen uh, to the, the trio of producers that we have. And in fact, our challenge is, is retail meats and and inventory management the thing that i know about uh you know six in one meats is that lots of species come through as well and so i'm willing to let you kind of dig in and just a little bit in terms of the breadth of uh the beef the pork the lamb the goat and in fact i know that you guys harvest some bison as well and so um what, what's your thoughts here just in terms of retail meats and kind of working with our producers that want to get connected. Spencer, the floor is yours, buddy. Hey, well, thanks. Thanks, Travis. Um, yeah. So what the Wolfs and Freeze and, and maybe Isaac a little bit touched on, I think, I think every livestock producer who's trying to market their animals directly to the customer runs into the same question and, and problem throughout that process, whether you figure it out right away early or you work through it, and that's um, essentially how to market every single aspect. Because if you're if you're slaughtering animals in this type of situation, you're trying to utilize every single pound out of that carcass, and being able to market that becomes difficult. Finding the correct customer to buy bones, or or whatever the case may be, you know that story that 
Um, Ron, you said about the, the slab of ribs of lamb. I used to market lamb ribs at NDSU just like that. And it is, you, you find those, you, the, those unique little cuts that just fly off the shelf and it adds value to your animal at the end of the day, because, uh, lamb ribs don't yield great if you're trimming them out or doing whatever the case other than selling them as ribs. So finding little different tricks and trades. Uh, while you're trying to market your animals is really the key when you're doing it on a small scale basis. Now, uh, six and one meats, we, we, we primarily slaughter beef um, and the pork, lamb, um, it, it is difficult in North Dakota. Uh, the, the time constraints, the, the poundage, everything, I mean, it, it makes sense on a business standpoint to be moving beef across that rail instead of lamb. And, I, and I'm Sure, that's uh, what a lot of lamb producers are running into right now. I, I know I get calls all the time of people wanting to slaughter lambs. Um, and that that is essentially what it comes down to. Like I said, we do mostly beef. We do hogs and lambs. Haven't done any goats yet. Once a month, essentially have that slots designated for. Uh, we try to do as many as we can. But of course, that means we need to cut back on our beef slaughter because we can't accomplish everything at once. We have poundage that we're able to get through on a weekly basis, uh, whether that be beef carcasses, pork carcasses, lamb carcasses. You know, you, you can calculate the stuff based on number of head, pounds. Pounds works a lot better, but you kind of have to go with number of head in my shoes because you don't know how big these animals are. Um yeah, so the, 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 the further processed meats, that's, that was kind of my, my interest at NDSU. Um, Travis, thanks for saying that I got my master's. I actually uh, didn't defend my thesis, but I appreciate the, the MS on my name. Um, my working research, on it. Yeah, working on it. Going to be working for a while on it. Um, my research was based on uh, shelf life of, of fresh meat. Um, and then my uh, kind of my passion, my side well, I taught a class at NDSU, kind of what I kind of really dived into was the further processed meats, um, the science behind it, how it works, how to create, um, you know, an appealing product without losing yield and value, because that's at the end of the day, uh, what really matters. Now, everybody on a small scale basis is kind of in a unique situation when it comes to let's, let's, let's talk about yields, right? Because when we're throwing in 100 pounds of snack sticks into the smokehouse and you're coming out with, let's say, 80 pounds by the time it's packaged, it's 75. You know, whatever that yield may be, it's always going to be different. Um, you guys are in a unique situation that you can set your own prices, right? So that yield, you know, I, I work the, – the companies that come in and help us with our equipment work in the large-scale – processing facilities as well where in the large scale processing facilities yield is everything because they're in a little bit more of a competitive market now the way this small direct to consumer market is taking off i think competition will be growing amongst everybody but right now you have the unique ability to set your prices uh travis spent you know the first 10 minutes going over yields yes yield is important very very important in both of our lines, whether it's me cutting it or, or you taking a live animal and, and trying to uh, uh, direct market to consumers. But you're, you're in kind of a unique situation where that price is a little easier to figure out, um, not necessarily figure out, but, but, but easier to still make money for, for everybody, for you. And um, Beth, you, you did, you know, it's great to hear something along those lines of you're making profit but you're not gouging your customers, right? I think I think all customers should hear that because that's that's something that gets brought up all the time is why is meat so expensive? Well, if you sit down and actually figure out what the cost is of all this stuff, it, it, it's it's crazy. Um, so it's, yeah, we're, we're, we're all in kind of a unique, fun situation. Thank you, Spencer. A uh, question comes in terms of your guys' thoughts and again, uh, as, as you think about beef, cattle, pork, uh, sheep, goats, what comes across, I mean, do you have a designated pricing structure of saying, hey, I'm going to bring this in here. This is what it costs. 
And in fact, I guess I would expand on that just a little bit more in terms of the, the processing. Do you, for, to package those, is it a, a certain amount per hanging weight or how, how does it work with your guys' company? Yeah, so everything's based on a, on a carcass weight, dollar per pound or whatever the case may be. Pay, based on hanging weight is what everybody calls it. It's the carcass weight, right? Um, anything additional past that, uh, vacuum packaging, you'll see as an additional fee, and that is what we do as well. Vacuum packaging is an additional processing fee based on the pounds that gets packaged. Um, you know, you, you see it. I Being a part of the Dakota Meat Processors Association, I've gotten to know a lot of the butcher shops across the state of North Dakota, and, and you see a lot of shops do it lots of different ways. And at the end of the day, we're, we're all doing the similar job. All of us are doing it slightly different. All of us have different expenses. All of us are calculating things out slightly different. So you, not every single plant is going to be the exact same, but uh, just know that the expenses that go into it, big one is obviously time and labor. Um, so we, and that's both the time it took to harvest the animal uh, and the time it took to cut the animal, the time it took to package the animal, like that, those are your big three, right? And then you have your, uh, how long did it sit in the cooler? Those are all expenses associated into your processing fees and, and what you are paying for when you bring the animal to us. Um, big thing in the small meat processing facilities right now is disposal of, of the guts. Um, we use a company based out of Long Prairie, Minnesota. Uh, that comes and picks everything up, but it's very expensive um, for us to pay them to come and get it. There's lots and lots of new ideas and thoughts and different ways to try to grab some value out of those byproducts of harvesting animals. Nothing's really quite there, set in stone, proven to be beneficial for any party involved quite yet, but there's a lot of research um, going into that. So there's, there's a lot of expenses that goes into processing on a small scale. Um, but at the end of the day, time, labor, um, and how many pounds you can fit on one single trolley hanging on the rail is kind of the name of the game. Super. Thank you so much, Spencer. I mean, I appreciate all that you guys do. And, uh, I know a lot of producers are, are, uh, able to work with you, uh, on all of those different species. And again, it's uh, a lot of making those connections. And when I think about it from the local meats producer, the, the producer that's just this, a striving to make it uh, past that level and make that connection. We have three great examples, but it's a, it's not an easy venture and it certainly needs a cooperation and the collaboration um, of those uh, local processors. And so, in fact, again, we've, we've talked about lots of, of different things on here. I actually have a, a talented individual, Robert, are, are you, uh, are you there and joining us? I'm here, bud. Okay, Robert. Uh, so I've included Robert to just, uh, Robert works as our vice president of sales for, for Double J Lamb. And again, this one's uh, more lamb centric than, than truthfully I preferred on this one. But again, I described it that the beef cattle portion uh, sells more quarters and halves and uh, the pork sells, uh, at least in our area, uh, just a little bit more of the, the full carcasses as well. And so I included Robert, uh, I, I let him uh, kind of listen and talk about it. But I think one of the things that we need to keep into consideration uh, as we're describing those, and you've, you've heard obviously a trio of success stories of being able to provide that local product uh, to our consumers. But the reason that I um, included Robert is because I think he speaks for a larger segment of our industry. And in fact, uh, again, so some of the products that come through uh, of sheep based uh, Robert has been uh, at the forefront and uh, is, is based in the New England area. And as we think about meats that are going out of it and we're digging just a smidge away from the local portion, but I appreciated his thoughts in terms of just some macroeconomics uh, type ideas. And so Robert, what, what did you see? What are we doing right? What are we doing wrong? Um, what do you see from a bigger picture standpoint? Go ahead. So on a larger scale, I mean, you know, we're one of the bigger processors of, of wool sheep in, in the United States. And we, we ship probably 90% of what we produce goes to the Northeast, to New York, New Jersey. Um, a lot of it is actually in carcass form. So we do a lot of the carcass to New York, New Jersey. Um, we do some 
production in our facility. We do fab. Um, we've been currently doing that since uh, September. So <clears throat> on a larger scale, um, you know, we, we, we produce just lamb. We do a little bit of custom, not a lot. But, you know, all our cuts and everything go to the Northeast, like I said. Um, carcass forms go anywhere from the Pennsylvania region all the way up to New Jersey, New York. Um, we harvest anywhere from two to 3,000 lambs per week. Um, we fabricate anywhere from three to 500 per week as well. And custom, we're doing a couple of hundred to 300 per week. Good enough, enough so that you know where we're at in terms of an industry, right, Robert? And and uh, at least connecting with the the customer and the consumer. And so you you've gotten to see it uh, again. Yeah, That's exactly. I mean, you know, we we basically primarily are selling to wholesalers and breakers, so you know, not really direct to consumer. Um, on the restaurant front. So they're doing that. I mean, hopefully one day we'll, we'll, we'll be rolling with direct to retail at, at, as a big menu for us. Um, you know, I, I think our biggest um, problem at the moment is transportation is probably our biggest challenge as an industry right now is we're getting wheels under product, but um the cost of moving product in a full trailer across the country is pretty extensively expensive at this current moment. That's probably our biggest challenge as a company, probably our biggest expense to date right now. Um, if, if I was to say product wise, I think we do pretty good at, at moving just about 90% of the animal with only about 10% of it going into the freezer at the moment. And, Right now, that 10% seems to be loins at the moment. <laughs> well, and today's function is on, uh, you know, retail meats and, and inventory control. And Robert, just a little bit of your thoughts. I mean, you said that, you know, the loins is more challenging. Um, you've been in this long enough. You've seen where legs have been the challenge or shoulders have been the challenge. Uh, it just depends to truthfully right or wrong seasonally kind of where we need to, to kind of be. Is that is that appropriate? Yeah, I mean, so shoulders right now actually haven't been that bad. I mean, we just got out of, I mean, a lot of cuts are very seasonal in the lamb industry. You know, when it come, when you talk about shoulders, we right now is when they probably will start to back up because we just got out of our holiday season. We just got out of Ramadan, which was huge, huge time of year for us. Um, hopefully, loins will prosper again coming into the summer month, the spring and summer months where, you know, it's a big grilling item and a lot of restaurants want to put it on as a grilled item. Um, you know, racks have never for us, I mean, historically I've been through years that, you know, with my prior other companies I've worked for, you know, we've had racks back up pretty profusely when prices got really, really out of control. And as we know, prices are out of control right now on live limbs, um, you know, and the cutout values get really expensive. Racks tend to back up, but right now they're, they're, selling pretty well. I mean, I can't keep enough racks in stock right now. You know, we're Good. about to start our, we're about to start <clears throat> our grinding operation in our further processing room and you know, there's a lot of interest in that. I mean, you know, if you look at historically on ground lamb, ground lamb in the last few years has is, is grown exponentially. It's been a huge retail item through the pandemic has been ground lamb. Absolutely and you, as uh, as you and I both know and in fact, uh, you know, just reinforcement from the American Lamb Board is that, uh, you know, the people that had wanted to consume lamb uh, did so with potentially different products or uh, different flavorings and uh, were able to do that with ground lamb. One of the things that, that I'm most excited about, again, of with my trio of colleagues here is, uh, as you saw, the snack sticks and the different sausages and kind of pulling that together. And in fact, we had Isaac uh, that gave a little bit of a background on on his work, uh, but also I'm I'm working with a, another colleague and graduate student of mine, Mr. Matthew Cheney, um, where we're looking at different lamb uh, sausage and marketability as well, and so looking at different flavor profiles that that people can like, and you know we can those can be the Merguez North African type uh, approaches or the Italian even sausages with lambs and 
they kind of pulling those even uh, like the snack sticks, like they said. And so there's some opportunity. Now to bring that back uh, just a little bit again, uh, there's some pork options and, you know, beef uh, approaches that some of those things when you, if those are your species of choice that you can look at making sure that you manage everything that happens. And so I know as we think about it, even if we were to use lamb as that token approach is that we can sell racks or sell legs, certainly during um, Easter. But if you decide to be a direct marketer, having an understanding in terms of just retail approaches of which ones sell well, which ones are going to sell well in your market, and which ones, uh, if that's the, the pork shoulder that isn't going to, or, or seeing having more of those available as we move into a grilling season. Uh, truthfully, Robert, seasonality might be one of the largest challenges that we have in the meat industry. And so can you just give a, a quick, uh, your thoughts in terms of just seasonality plus minus in the meat industry? Well, I could tell you on the lamb front seasonality, um, you know, obviously we just got out of the Easter months and that's a huge, huge time of year for lamb legs, whether it's boneless or bone in, um, we call them STO legs, split trotter off legs. They go like hotcakes through Easter. Now this year was a little bit different because prices were really high. It was slow moving, but at the end business picked up. Um, this time of year going into, um, depends on what region you live in, when you get out of the colder months, people put their grills on their back deck. And, you know, when it comes to legs, boning out legs and making kebabs is a big thing right now. Um, in retail, people want, you know, something they could throw in their grill. So when it comes to lamb, like loin chops out of a retail package, uh, the consumer will want that product that you know, sells very well in the summertime. This is definitely a different animal the last few years in our industry, as we all know. You can't predict anything anymore. Traditionally, that's how it moves, but I don't know how it's going to be this year. Hopefully, it pick loins will pick up. Racks typically start to fall off in the summer. They're very seasonal, they're very Christmas orientated, Thanksgiving. You know, and into Mother's Day and Easter, they sell well as, you know, pretty good. Shoulders, there's certain times of year people are boning them out for grind because they're not selling as well. Like the last few months, they sold through Ramadan. But, you know, as we get into the summer months, the shoulders kind of fall off. And a lot of people are using that for grind or stew meat. The larger producers. Right. Absolutely. And, in fact, and thanks. And, you know, even as we dig at this and, and talk a uh, you know, again, to, to make it multi-species related is that our next week's function um, will and, and is going to be more on, on customer relationships. But I want to just touch on a couple different things is that the Lamb Resource Center has a profit calculator um, and at the Lamb Resource Center that people can look at. And I know that, Robert, you're aware of this in terms of just identifying, well, should we take them to a larger weight? And in fact, uh, we have that as well to on the lamb board's website there to evaluate where you can be in lamb yield calculations. And the, one of the things that can be advantageous there as we think about it from Isaac and Jonah and Ron and Beth's approach is to be able to figure out what, uh, what is the cuts that we're gonna be able to merchandise. And these are available uh, in terms of different, uh, uh, different species as well on their own particular approaches. Um, of looking at what can we price those at. And so that allows us the opportunity, uh, again, to kind of be able to, to tell that story and to just try to see what we can be in terms of pricing uh, so that you can make your um, funds and make your numbers available so that we can be able to sell, uh, particularly in terms of, of retail products uh, that we pulled together here. And again, well, I appreciate uh, some thoughts and some processes of what we want to do. Um, but uh, Jonah, do you have any last words of, uh, for those people that want to be able to direct market their products? Well, I think they just kind of have to feel out their area. You know, if there's some interest in it, um, maybe just go out there and maybe just do some visiting before you start going in through the whole license processing and whatever, because it's, it's expensive. I mean, it's not a get rich fast overnight. It takes some work, but I mean, if you're a promoter of lamb and wool, I mean, 
it's you have to go in it for the long haul. I don't it's not something you can get in there and then jump back out quick as far as I'm concerned. Ron and Beth. Well, for us, Travis, I think, you know, seems how farmers market is the biggest one is, is we try to listen to what our customers uh, want, you know, be it the heart, the liver or whatever. Dog bones are a big thing now. And then so we're selling just about everything we we uh, possibly can out of that lamb. But we let their buying determine uh, what our cuts are in the following, you know, in the next processing or or whatnot. And so when our farmer's market season's done, our goal is not to be sitting on a lot of inventory uh, because inventory is expensive in the winter months. At times we, you know, we don't get in front of our customers, but uh, having a website or a Facebook page with social media is a big thing. And, and that helps us connect to a lot of people and, and just throwing things out there because people like to keep track of what you have going on. Be it if our per, our sheep, you know, our our live animal end of it, we have a lot of people that follow it, and uh, and that makes a connection on a lot of our future sales. So be visible. Absolutely, Isaac, are you ready for your story? <laughs> yeah, um, building off what uh, Ron was saying. Uh, yeah, uh, having that social media and that customer interaction, especially with uh, doing the direct to farm marketing like we do and bringing the people out to our operation, it's important to put um, a good look on your operation and agriculture in general. Um, this is the consumer's chance to meet face to face with that producer and build a relationship and then get to a little bit know a little bit more about why we do what we do. Uh, because not everybody has that tie anymore. So this is your chance to positively impact uh, maybe not just that one individual, but they'll spread it on and educate others about why ranchers and farmers are some of the hardest working people in the nation. Good, good. And thank you, Robert, for your thoughts and, and, and pulling uh, everything together for us. Spencer, uh, I think that you're at a, a critical and an important part uh, within our industry. Um, and uh, I think as we think about it from a producer standpoint and, you know, home base for me of at least where I grew up is South Dakota. And so I moved north just a smidge um, uh, up as well. But uh, I think that knowing and understanding kind of who you're going to work with uh, is something that's important. And so uh, the meat dude, uh, tag, you're it. Uh, can you provide us uh, what we need to do? And in fact, uh, provide a quality segue because next week's uh, function is building your consumer relationship for success on May 24th. Spencer, uh, you're on mute yet, but uh, what's your, what's your closing thoughts? So you all kind of hit the nail on the head already, but uh, the, the communication at the end of the day is key, both for your customers and for the people, whoever you're dealing with on my side of things too. Um, knowing exactly what you want, coming to your butcher saying, this is what we want. This is what our customers want. This is what I have in my head. This is what my customers have in their head. And this is what I want you to do with it, right? Um, that's probably something that I do on a daily basis with even just our, our custom pro custom customers, if that makes sense. Um, but yeah, I, I, communication is key. Um, pictures, there's so many different terms and there's so many different ways to, to cut meat at the end of the day. And, and knowing what, where your customers are shopping other than from you, knowing what they're familiar with, uh, actually will help you because you kind of have the same um, insight of what they have, what they're trying to explain to you essentially. So. Thank you, Spencer. And uh, again, uh, appreciate all of our talented panelists and appreciate Lindy for co-hosting this uh, with us at North Dakota State University Extension and our function that we are aiming to provide uh, in terms of the, our, our local farm to market webinar series. And so this is number three of a five segment series uh, of webinars uh, looking at local meat production. So thanks again to our panelists and guests and our attendees 
uh, for everything that you do and helping to connect the dots uh, from consumers and, and first off, obviously, from producers uh, to consumers and learning where we where food comes from and being able to market it and add value to our products. So thank you very much. And for everybody that's joined us, we kindly appreciate your assistance and our panelists. Thanks for sharing your knowledge. Have a great night on behalf of NDSU Extension and our charge uh, to help continue to uh, share and, and uh, share knowledge and change lives. Thanks so much. Have a good night. Thank you.